Welcome to General Counselling Live. If you're new to the General Counselling podcast, we bring together the brightest minds from the best law firms, the people who know all the detail of the law, with the lawyers leading in-house teams at world-class businesses who manage the coming together of legal issues with commercial reality. We then spend an hour going through a particular sector, and we've covered topics from diversity and mental well-being through to private equity and life sciences. Just before we start, I better get a quick plug in for Montresor Legal. As you'll see from the brilliant guests we get on General Counselling, Montresor is the best connected legal recruiter. We're staffed exclusively by people that really know their stuff and give everything to help their clients make smart hires and their candidates access to opportunities to realise their potential. So if you're a law firm or a business looking to hire a lawyer or a lawyer wanting to talk options, drop me a message on LinkedIn or go to montresorlegal.com to find an expert in your field. So back to why we're here. This is our first live streamed event. So thank you very much for tuning in. Bit of housekeeping before we start. Everyone is on mute. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the recording. So if you have a question for our expert panel, please type it into the chat function and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. And I should also say that all of our guest experts are here in a personal capacity rather than representing their organization's official views. So let's crack on. Four and a half years on from the EU referendum, the UK is actually about to leave the EU. As we go to air, there still isn't a trade deal in place. And even if they're announcing one as I speak, it won't cover financial services. So what does that mean for your business or your financial services clients? What are your people gonna to need to do differently in three weeks? Should you be worried? We've assembled a veritable brains trust of financial services law for today's panel. Representing two top right financial regulatory practices and from investors managing literally trillions of dollars. So to introduce the panel, um, first we have Charlotte Stalin from Simmons and Simmons. Hi, thank you, Tom. Uh, delighted to be here today. So I'm Sean Stalin. I'm the head of the financial institutions sector at Simmons & Simmons. I've had the joy of spending the last five years uh, looking at Brexit related issues as I started before the vote, um, looking at it both from the sell and the buy side perspective. Um, and obviously, uh, we are very much um, waiting with bated breath as to whether or not we'll get a deal, um, which I think, as you say, from a kind of, I guess, uh, financial services perspective, it's not going to, uh, I guess, give us much from day one, but at least it's a, it's a starting point. Okay. Um, from Marshall Waste, we have John May. Thank you, Tom. Um, great to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm John May. Um, I'm the general counsel of Marshall Waste. I've been at the firm since 2005. And actually, before that, I was at uh, Simmons, Small World. Um, perhaps pertinent to today's discussion, um, two things that um, we've done in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, um, are, which have a significant Brexit uh, angle, <clears throat> is that in 2010, we, we moved all of our Cayman hedge funds to Ireland. So we are clearly more invested in the EU issues than maybe many hedge fund managers are. Um, and two years ago, we established uh, an Irish supermanco entity uh, in Dublin, um, again, as part of our contingency planning uh, for Brexit. So um, Brexit obviously has been a topic that um, we've all lived with and I've been certainly living with for the last um, four years, but especially the last two years. And uh, we wait we wait to see what will come of this evening. I mean, I think, um, as you say, no financial services deal. Um, it's more, more now about whether there's going to be duty on German cars and German washing machines, I think, um, and whether there's going to be any food coming into the country in a few weeks' time. Longer term, financial services certainly will be a very interesting topic that we can uh, we can get into. Perfect. Sounds um, full of the joys of the opportunities of Brexit, I think, there from, uh, from, from John. Um, completing the Simmons uh, alumni theme of today's panel, um, we have Mark O'Brien from Wellington Management. Hi there, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm uh, Mark O'Brien. I'm the head of legal for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Wellington Management. Um, I've been at the firm for six years before, as Tom points out, uh, I was at Simmons as well. Um, and we have um, uh, we're a big, as I'm sure most people on the call know, big institutional manager, uh, just over a trillion dollars under management globally across 
uh, pretty much all asset classes. And we have a big presence in London uh, on both the client facing and investment side of the business. So um, Brexit and the impact of Brexit has, uh, of course, been a, a hot topic for us. And, and London has very much been the hub of our European operations historically. So the impact of Brexit on that is, is something we've been spending a lot of time and energy on. And uh, finally, um, a, a big thanks to our final panelist who stepped up at very short notice, um, replacing um, his partner, Michelle Kirshner from Gibson Dunn, who unfortunately had to um, attend to some personal stuff. Uh, Martin Coombs from Gibson Dunn. Uh, thanks, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tom says, uh, my name is Martin Coombs. I'm a senior associate in the London office of Gibson Dunn. I sit within the firm's financial institutions and investment funds practices, so specialise in advising on UK and EU financial uh, services legislation. And, and as everyone has said so far, spent uh, the past few years focusing on Brexit, whether that be from the perspective of, of UK regulated firms, but also those based in the EU 27 trying to access the UK market and also looking at the direct or sometimes indirect uh, implications for so-called third country firms as well. Perfect. So first of all, thank you very much, guys, for, for joining uh, General Counselling this morning. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to have you. Um, I'm going to start my first question um, directed uh, to Charlotte, which is how well prepared do you think the UK financial services industry is for the end of the transition period in three weeks time? Well, thank you, Tom. I, I guess overall, uh, the industry is very well prepared. Uh, I don't think anyone who's regulated in the UK uh, today has been able to avoid uh, having, you know, proper uh, continuity plans in place. Um, so I think um, for sure, um, larger institutions or those that have significant European footprint will have established or set up presences in Europe. Um, kind of ready to go. I guess the challenge is really in relation to the any residual business from the UK and or existing business uh, that may not have moved across uh, for one of many reasons. Uh, and that's really where we'll see the challenge over the next few weeks, because we're still in a situation where I guess EU member states are making up their mind as to whether or not there will be arrangements in place to allow for some of that business to continue, if that makes sense. We're seeing TPRs coming out uh, left, right and centre right now. And, and with so little time, it's the question about what does that actually mean and how to manage that. And do you think there are other particular sectors that are likely to be to, to feel that more than others if, for example, the equivalence thing question wasn't settled? Well, I guess the more business you do, I mean, the, the more touch points you have, uh, it's the size of the business, I guess, the more you're involved, I mean, in um, from, you know, from trading to, you know, uh, treasury to everything, I guess, from a sell side perspective, your, your touch points in Europe are likely to be more significant. Um, I think the harshest line is obviously on the retail side, but then retail tends to be more domestic. So it's less of a cross border. So I would say you're probably feeling it uh, more on the sell side. Uh, but again, I'm sure Mark and John will say that, you know, they're feeling it from the buy side as well. Mark and John, one of the things that, I mean, again, it's a it's broad brush, but you, you tended to notice throughout the Brexit debate that people on the, the business guys on the buy side were probably more enthusiastic about Brexit as a concept <clears throat> than people on the sell side. Um, John, from your perspective, is, is, do you think, do you see that continuing? Has that continued from the from the referendum onwards in, in your view? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, as you say, there have been some fairly <clears throat> high profile backers of Brexit um, in the industry. Uh, although, to be fair, there's also been a fair number of, of, of strong remainers among the industry. Um, so I wouldn't say it's entirely one sided. Um, I mean, clearly, um, the, the sort of the, the, the big question, I think, for, for the industry is going to be around um, financial services and to what extent we ever get a deal, because uh, if there is even any deal, even on the more basic, you know, um, goods, um, goods elements, which, you know, I think most people would agree are the, are the kind of the, the really key bits that we need to, to make you know, life continue in some sense normality from what it is today. Um, and um, 
and 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 we I mean we've been proceeding on the basis that there won't be a financial services deal and there won't be equivalence um but clearly if there were to be equivalence um then um and we brexited then then in you know for some that may be a vindication of what a great idea Brexit was. You know, we've taken back control, to use the awful sort of um, mantra uh, it's, uh, that some people are using, should we say. Um, and uh, and actually, you know, you're still getting some of the upsides of it. I mean, whereas at the moment, what, what we're looking at is a fairly skinny deal, if any deal at all. A lot of uncertainty on top of on top of this this minor pandemic issue that we're all trying to deal with, so I mean, there's there's quite a lot of challenges at the moment for the industry. I think um, I think a lot of the a lot of the sort of sound bites, oven baked, all this stuff that were were rolled out over the last few years haven't quite yet come to pass. It's fair to say. Um, so, uh, but I, I think the slight problem you have with with the whole um, with the whole sort of Brexit debate <clears throat> is that it's such a polarising debate. Um, and, and obviously, certain certain media are really getting stuck in and and and, and singing their views even now. That um, even if there is good reason or evidence to suggest that one side or the other maybe was the better option, um, I'm not entirely sure that there are gonna, there are going to be people that will necessarily um, see that, and that they will still continue to believe and, and state very vocally that theirs was the right view, come what may. I think it's not one that you can see many people changing sides on, whether it's financial services or otherwise. Um, I think I certainly agree with that. Um, Mark, from your perspective, do, do you do you think that there is going to be some form of equivalence type arrangement, or is is your view similar to John's that it, it, we're going to be going a slightly different way? Um, well, you know, I think one hopes for the best, but plans for the worst, and and, and our approach has been. Um, to maintain as much optionality as we can, whilst also making sure that we can continue to access the markets uh, in the way that we uh, that is the most efficient, it's the most useful to our clients, and that we can continue to access and service clients, uh, which of course is the most important thing, and um, uh, and indeed continue to, to to look for new new prospects in the areas where, where we think there's opportunity uh, opportunity for us. So I haven't asked the question because I've got no idea. Uh, <laughs> it seems to, it seems to blow hot and cold every time. I, I have to assume that when the dust settles and perhaps tempers on both sides of the table have have calmed a little that there is uh, opportunity to take a sort of objective view of whatever divergence exists at that point between the UK and the EU, what the direction of travel is in both of those, uh, both of those blocks, um, and you know, comparing that with other third country equivalent jurisdictions uh, already and how divergent their regulatory environment is. Uh, obviously, uh, Wellington, we spend a lot of time thinking about that in terms of the US, uh, so it seems objectively reasonable to assume that in due course there will be some mechanism to continue to operate somewhat seamlessly but i can't see uh, i don't think anyone can can really feel confident that that's likely to be in place at the end of this year or perhaps even the end of end of next year so our approach has been uh def defensive and maintaining optionality against that hope but but not Basing any assumption on the fact that it will arrive in time uh, to uh, to be of immediate practical use. I think one of the things that you certainly feel that is relevant when things like this happen is that the larger managers and financial institutions have are able to like all, all, allocate huge amounts of resources into preparing for things like this. If you're at a smaller fund or a, or a fintech or or something that is maybe has less infrastructure behind it. Martin, what, what are the things that people should be most concerned they need to start doing differently or stop doing as of the 1st of January? Well, thanks, Tom. And, and obviously, what, what, what one, one smaller fund, one manager does from another manager is very much uh, um, business specific and, and very much depends what their current footprint is in the UK, in the EU, EU and, and to what extent it, it needs to continue to either provide cross-border services or indeed access um, EU investors. I think obviously, as you say, the larger managers do have the infrastructure in place. They, they have managed to have larger teams uh, in, in their brigs at contingency planning projects. Um, but at the same time that, you know, the smaller firms still have the flexibility 
um, 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 to be able to move and really, I suppose the, the key things, what are you, you, you looking to be concerned about um, post this year? Well, o on the one hand, you've got sort of your harder topics or your hard legal and regulatory requirements, which naturally you, you will need to abide by. And if we think about things such as, you know, reporting, making sure you're reporting to the right, the right party at the right time, um, but on the other hand, there's a sort of slightly sort of softer topics that that people aren't necessarily focusing on. And obviously, uh, managers are potentially dealing with EU regulators that they've not previously dealt with. And, and obviously, no two regulators are the same. And so how the FCA may approach a particular topic, it, its supervisory um, remit and its particular sort of risk tolerances are different from, say, the AMF or the CBI or BaFin. So I think it's really understanding where potentially the gaps are and, and what, what you know sort of what hiccups there could be along the road. Charlotte, how um, how tolerant do you think the various different regulatory or enforcement bodies are going to be with teething issues around compliance to some of these changes? Well, it's, it's a difficult one, Tom, because uh, no regulator is coming out saying anything about forbearance or generally kind of acceptance. Uh, I think that the rhetoric coming out of Europe is pretty full on to say to firms to be ready, be ready. Um, I think to some degree it will depend on what actually happens. I mean, some, and it comes down to the national regulators, I would suspect most likely. Um, so I think again, uh, whether or not we'll see any regulator kind of being you know, tougher on this, um, you know, it, I, I suspect that will be in some of the countries um, where the regulator historically hasn't been as tolerant, if you see what I mean. So, I, I mean, I think it depends on what it is as well. I mean, we're talking about such a wide range of activities, you know, from are you fully set up or, you know, have all the people been, you know, moved across, you know, to what extent do you need to use London operations, uh, you know, are you outsourcing more than you should to, you know, you know, but, you know, clearly doing direct business from the UK <laughs> into particular European countries without, you know, having taken notice of, of the change. So the spectrum is, is, is enormous, to be honest. I think within the operational framework, you know, making this work, getting clients transitioned, um, you know, where there's clear attempts to having gone through all the hurdles, but it's just taking a bit longer. I think that there will be more tolerance. I think on the other hand, the continuation uh, of business without considering local regimes, I think the regulators will have less tolerance. Because you can, you must feel, you feel sympathy for some. If you imagine a private wealth manager who's managing money for complexly set up individuals who probably have domiciles all, all over the place and which regulatory body is therefore looking after their interests and having to unpick that for every single one of your clients is yeah, not. I mean, it's hugely complex legal issues here uh, at play and the law isn't clear as it stands. So, you know, trying to resolve these issues, as you say, across boundaries um, with no clear legal position and then take a risk-based view on the continuation of business, for example, is, is not an easy one. Um, but again, if you look from a perspective of risk, you know, from a regulatory, you know, investor protection, likely to be higher alert within regulators is going to be on the retail side. So you kind of, you know, it's a bit, and I think again, with these things, often as if something happens, an event happens, or, you know, something that uh, draws attention to something. So I think again, it's 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 difficult to know exactly what that may look like. But um, you know, in the current you know pandemic and situations occurring, um, you know, you could see you know where the market goes against particular corporations or others. You know that there may be extra tension on spotlight coming in. John, given those complexities, it it, it must be incredibly difficult for external advisors to give really like helpful, practical, commercial, regulatory advice in this area to firms like yours. Which, how have you found the, the advice you've been getting from your external law firms and, and what are the ones who've done well, how have they done it? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly been a good opportunity for for law firms to to come up with commoditized products, uh, which of course a number of the larger firms already had in place prior to Brexit. Um, and and really, I mean, to go to your point a bit about scale, I think it's really important and helpful for smaller businesses that they are able to get access to information which is, if you like, um, almost crowdfunded. You know, if if if, if, it's, if it's a sort of subscription type service. Um, you know, clearly Simmons, Allen and Overy, uh, other, and other uh, other brands are available. Provide something along these lines, where you know you are able to get um, at a at a fraction of the price that you would have paid had you got a bespoke survey done. Um, essentially, answers to most of the questions that you probably would have asked anyway. Maybe not every question, but then you can always top it up with you know specific questions. And, and I think the same, very much true around 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 Brexit um, and marketing, which is a huge area for asset manager and asset management firms uh, marketing into Europe and to sort of understand the, the, you know, what is now the, the, um, the patchwork regulatory environment um, in the EU27 that the UK-based firms, for example, now have to deal with. Um, and so that's been an important area, uh, but no, definitely lots of, um, there have been lots of sort of work streams really that we've had to look at. I'm sure Mark is the same for him, you know, without presuming too much in terms of all the different elements of of Brexit um, and, you know, the tr trade related queries, marketing related queries, um, uh, questions around delegation, questions around the MOUs, which is absolutely critical um, and uh, thankfully appear to be all, all set for the end of the year. So, um, you know, I've actually found the advice um, I've you know, been very happy with the advice that we've had, um, and a combination of the two, the, the, the subscription service as well as the, the bespoke advice that we've needed to get. I mean, what's the shame, what the, the real great shame about all this, though, as much as I love law firms, and, you know, as, as, a, as a lawyer who used to work in one, you know, I do feel that this, this sort of never-ending Brexit sort of morass that we're in, with all these sort of, you know, the negotiations constantly um, dragging on, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the political bickering and everything else. I mean, it has just created this massive um, sea of uncertainty for industry generally, not just financial services. And um, the best, uh, the firms that really clean up at times like this are the law firms, the, the big four, the consultants. Um, you know, which is fair enough. I mean, that's what they're there for to advise. But it's it's a shame that we have to ask for quite so much advice. I think um, that's just the reality though, of, of of life, isn't it? Someone I think I'd add saying, to that. Sorry, Tom. I was just going to add to that. I agree with what John said, and I suppose you know, I guess I place a premium on those firms that, again, start uncertainty, including all that legal uncertainty, are are, are able to give a sort of pragmatic view and a sense of what the direction. of travel across the industry is because when there's no legal certainty it's very hard to be sure that you're right but at least you can get some confidence that you're not going to be alone uh, which sometimes is, uh, is 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 almost as good yeah i mean someone in a <clears throat> one of the previous podcasts was was had gave a figure of how much money the sell side has spent getting ready for brexit and it was an absolutely petrified i can't remember the, remember the exact number but it was an awful lot of money um and i guess all of that is finding its way to consultants and and maybe some internal compliance and regulatory support but it has yeah it's been an enormous burden on on everyone um martin what, what in your view what are the things what what is the support you think the clients you work with is are, are most going to need in the next six weeks or so or the next six months maybe um as they get ready for this I think as John and John and Mark have, have alluded to, that the main problem we faced for, for years now, and, and, and it's sort of quite apt that we're we're discussing also the day where Boris Johnson's going to Brussels, is is just the sheer uncertainty in many areas. And that's obviously uncertainty on the political front, but uncertainty on the regulatory front. And it, we we've had lots of sort of developments over the past couple of months, which uh, say I'm thinking things like the share trading obligation, the derivatives trading obligation, equivalents under the financial uh, services bill, all these kind of things which have come really very much in the last, you know, the, you know, at the eleventh hour really, which is things which we could have really benefited from a lot earlier. And as you say, that that does rack up cost for you know and uncertainty for people like John and Mark when they're looking to to see what Brexit means for their businesses. And I, I suppose it's really from our perspective, keeping on top of, of, of the regulatory developments. We're doing lots of work with the various industry trade bodies just to try and get to a position where we, we can try and reduce the, the areas of this uncertainty, those sort of residual areas of, 
of risk within people's businesses that are focusing on. But as I say, um, people for a long period of time were focusing on things such as equivalence, and, and we've sort of touched upon that, but obviously equivalence means different things for different sectors, and it, it, it's, not, it's not whole across the business. And I think, you know, people at, at one stage were really wanting hard-baked equivalence, because the, the, the question is, if we do end up getting equivalence, then that can actually be removed at certain stages. So it's really trying to work with, work with our clients to see, well, what is the worst case scenario? And, and people have been working on, you know, a hard Brexit and saying, well, if this is the case, what do we need to do? And anything which is, is better than that, we just work backwards from. Um, so as I say, it's it, any, any reduced uncertainty that, that we can sort of demonstrate is obviously of benefit to, to the client and the wider industry. And Charlotte, if you're looking at it holistically from the, you know, you, you, re you represent or you advise sell side and buy side clients and, and people across the financial services sector, um, to what extent are you, have you seen them redeploy or relocate investment and infrastructure professionals into the EU? And is that something you think is going to accelerate over the course of the, the coming months? Well, I guess the answer is that, yes, I mean, um, anyone who's setting up an onshore European hub, uh, which many of both sell side and the, you know, the larger institutional buy side, uh, you know, uh, industry have done, obviously requires people. So whether that is kind of relocating or recruiting, I guess the challenge has been the uncertainty as to what the end <laughs> looks like in the sense of end of transition, how, whether there would be equivalence, no equivalence, to what extent business could continue either using UK balance sheet for the purposes of the sales side and or using uh, UK based staff. And I think that that driver, obviously the fact that the closer we come to no deal, no equivalence um, puts more focus on a greater onshore European presence. Um, I think part is a little bit of wait and see to the extent of if we do get equivalence within the six, 12 months, would that mean for some businesses that you don't need to have as many people on shore as you would otherwise? But a big, the biggest thing here has obviously been the pandemic because in reality, it's even with the, the best will in the world, it hasn't been easy to necessarily achieve some of that relocation. And that has added pressure. I think that uh, from, a, from a banking perspective, the European regulators, ECB, et cetera, are absolutely clear that they are expecting people on the ground and regardless of pandemic, and that is putting pressure on the industry for sure, Tom. Yeah, that's a, that is a very interesting point, actually, in the, in the background to this is obviously been, it's, it's been a pretty weird year um, because of the pandemic. Um, Mark, how, to what extent has the pandemic affected um, your preparations for, for Brexit in particular? Uh, um, I think it has sort of accelerated really a, trend that we're already reacting to which is more flexibility uh, for how people work uh, for us with us do their jobs so in a sense uh, both Brexit and the pandemic have accelerated what was already um, was already starting really at the firm and perhaps in the industry as well uh, which is that trend for more flexibility and perhaps this is a more Wellington specific point but increasing uh, growth in Europe continental Europe uh, rather than the UK so the two together have allowed and required us to accelerate perhaps what we were going to do anyway uh, but the difficulty of both is that we're doing it in a slightly rushed way uh, and this is hard to pick up Charlotte's point to know really what the end state is that we are uh, trying to, to target because it's a little bit earlier than we perhaps otherwise would be uh, would be would, would be doing in, in an ordinary environment whatever an ordinary environment looks like I think I have to go back to 2006 but, but that's a different <laughs> debate perhaps. Good fun ordinary environments yeah we miss those. Um, John same same question to you how, how is the COVID pandemic and the various restrictions that have been in place since February, March time um, impacted your ability at Marshall Ways to get everything ready for, uh, for January. Well, mercifully, not not too much, really. I mean, I think, <clears throat> thank goodness, thank goodness for video phones, first of all, and um, you know, decent um, decent sort of technology 
systems that allow you to uh, to have you know virtual desktops um, anywhere in the world, not just actually in the office. Uh, so, as far as you know, specifically my team's concerned, the I mean, clearly we were all locked down in the UK anyway um, back in March, April time, um, and um, uh, and actually the uh, the sort of uh, the the ability for everyone to work remotely worked really seamlessly actually. So there wasn't a, a drop off in the ability to deliver the Brexit project among other things. And then and then as the lockdown was was relaxed gradually, um, you know, some of the team started to come in a few days each week. Um, you know, while while still working flexibly as well and and, and quite a good balance actually, which again, you know, has helped um just in terms of the ability for, for everyone to to interact slightly more readily than would otherwise be the case um so i've you know I've, I've been i've been sort of very very pleased actually with with how how we have been able to deliver um uh, deliver the projects i mean i think it's clearly not been an easy time there for anyone um and um you know the uncertainty that one feels personally right now um you know is 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 a sort of consideration and a concern uh, for for anyone i think and uh, and i think just getting the right balance in people's lives and you know maybe the the, the sort of the, the fun that one would normally have over summer nice holidays for most hasn't happened this year <laughs> and, uh, and there's not really any prospect of it happening for quite some time even with a vaccine so i think you know one has to be very alert to that and, and mental health and, and other considerations really and, and ensuring that that even though people aren't you know necessarily in the office with you um that you're you know you're conscious of, of of kind of how how they're actually doing and 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 the interaction remains a sort of a, a very sort of healthy and positive one uh, because it, it isn't it isn't the case, I think, that you know you can just move entirely to remote working without any impact. Uh, but but actually, in the in the circumstances, I, you know, I think I think we've done we've done well, and I think certainly the law firms that we work with seem to cope very well too. You know, that being said, um, you, would you want it to last another six months? No, I don't think we would. I, I, you know, I think I think a lot of people are fed up now. Um, a lot of stuff, quite frankly, um, and these dark cold winter's days don't help and um, you know whereas maybe being working from home in may in a nice with, with gorgeous heat wave that we had and you could be out in your garden sort of you know after work and you didn't have to commute and what didn't seem quite so grim did it but um but <laughs> it's certainly not the case now i think there's two, there's two points i pick up about one, um, one i think it was in my lifetime of 42 years the best consistent run of 12 weeks weather that we've had in, in, in since I've been alive, that period of lockdown. And yeah, obviously that doesn't happen in January and February. And I think it is a mental health point and a well-being perspective. The second one is, is how well law firms and other professional advisors coped within a ludicrously quick period to being able to do very complex work remotely at, with absolutely almost no notice. And I think as a you know, as our economy, a service-based economy, law firms, accountancy practices are some of our absolute best organisations, and they're obviously not you know written about in the press that much. But it was it was unreal how litigation, M and A, lending, restructuring, all that stuff that requires huge numbers of bodies from very experienced partners to complete rookies, um, all adapted within a two-week period, and and it wasn't. Really, given the circumstances, adapted incredibly well. Um, and Tom, if, I could, if I could just add on that, actually, because we obviously we've talked about the impact on on on, on you know, regulated businesses, but also on on law firms, but also from a from a regulatory perspective, it's it's been an unusual year for the regulator as well. So it, it it's not been business as usual from their perspective, and and although we've seen a degree of regulatory forbearance to some extent, we sort of say, well, what impact does COVID have on your on your Brexit planning? Well, we have said. Um, we have seen from both the FCA, but also the, the European regulators commentary, which is essentially to effect of, we, we're wary you've got COVID. Um, we know you're dealing with this, but Brexit is still happening. So it, it, it is just to be wary from, from, from our client's perspective that, um, yes, the regulator has been somewhat distracted in some regard, but next year we, we will see a focus on on some of those areas that they haven't necessarily been looking at this year. And one of them will be how firms have adapted for um, to implement Brexit. Yeah. We've, we've spoken quite a bit about the, the risk, the downside risk on Brexit. And I think that's completely understandable given where we certainly where we are on the cycle. Um, however, it would be good to look at 
what the panel think some of the upside opportunities within their um, fields or for their organizations may be. Um, Martin, if, you, if you're if you looking at the, the range of businesses that you advise, can you think of some of the uh, potential opportunities that may arise for them as a result of? I, yeah, I think I think when it's, it's helpful to think what actual opportunity would be afforded to the industry, you sort of look at this from well, from, from my perspective, from a regulatory perspective, and it's really going to be how does the regulator approach its role going forward? Because that, to some extent, will um, dictate to what extent we we divert from from EU rules covering asset management or, or the banking sector, or to what extent we actually stay more closely aligned to them. And we we we've, we've somewhat talked about equivalence, and there's been lots of talk over the the, the past few years about are we actually going to diverge because we might want equivalence? Um, but it's it's interesting, a couple of things we've picked up on recently, and obviously there's a, there's been a recent um, treasury uh, con- a paper about the future regulatory framework. And we've also actually seen a few sort of glimpses of, of, of an approach that, that the UK government, the regulators might take in, 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 albeit in certain specific sectors. So one example, if, if we look at the ESG space, so obviously ESG is a hot topic for everyone at, at this moment. And for those within the EU, you're, you're going to be complying with the SFDR um, next year. Um, but the UK is taking a slightly divergent approach to that. Um, and when you look at what the, e, the UK is proposing to do, it's far narrower than the EU's approach. And that raises sort of important questions about um, equivalence um, going forward, um, albeit that's one isolated example. And you say, well, if, if the UK is willing to diverge in that sense, is it willing to diverge in any other area of regulation? Maybe regulation may be sort of some of the more contentious areas around remuneration and, and whatnot. So it, from our perspective, the, the way the industry is able to, to benefit or otherwise from Brexit is slightly dictated by the approach that the regulator is going to adopt. Charlotte, what would your views on the potential sunlit uplands? Well, well, I guess I'm quite, I mean, I'm quite optimistic as a person, but I think that what I like so far from a, I completely take the point about divergence and fragmentation and all that is a real challenge for, in, for the industry. But I guess what the UK is being very clear about is the future of the UK as a global financial centre and investment in relationships going forward. So I guess from the point of view, the UK want to be a leader in regulations. They want to set agenda and continue to do that with IOSCO and others. But also the fact that they are working very hard on keeping the UK and the open market access uh, to ensure that institutional business can continue uh, into the UK. Uh, which is critical for any global financial centre. Uh, and also, I guess they are looking at opportunities to maybe find ways of creating deals with other third countries. So we've obviously seen statements on Japan, Switzerland. We've got Canada, US, maybe, and others. I mean, it depends on election, of course. But so I think from a, I guess, industry perspective, the EU27 is important, but for... Uh, people operating out of the UK, typically there's more to the world and the uh, UK has a lot to, to offer. So I think, again, I completely take the point on, on the divergence. I mean, the UK regulator is pretty clear to say that they will stay equivalent where they need to be equivalent and they, they will diverge when they think is a need to do so in areas where they think they can. Um, but I do think that, that, you know, looking forward and the UK, I guess, sees in some of the opportunities that they can because it is an open market compared to uh, Europe in particular, who's putting all the barriers up, um, is something I think we should be positive about if we can. John, what about your view on the, um, the upside, potential, potential upsides? Yeah, and I think a lot of it goes actually to the equivalence point, doesn't it? Because I think you know we're not going to have financial services equivalence clearly at the end of the year, um, uh, but there's a possibility, especially if there is some sort of skinny deal, there is a possibility that we will get it during next year on certain areas, such as MIFID, for example. Um, and and if we get equivalence, then obviously you know we will be tied in, but we get the upside of that, which is you know, the, the passport, for example, which, of course, we're losing uh, otherwise. Um, if, however, we don't get equivalence, there's not really a lot of point in some cases for us to be tied into some of these rules. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a two-way street, I think. And, uh, and there are certain rules 
to be perfectly honest, which aren't that great. Um, some of the reporting obligations, for example. I mean, in the MIFID, there's RTS 28. No one actually looks at that. There's um, there's under FMD, there's Annex 4. Um, I think there's a huge, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a question mark about what some of this data is actually used for and whether it is actually used. And there's arguably a moral hazard point on some regulators that they're getting all this data and, 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 and don't necessarily do anything with it in some cases. There's you know, short selling regulation um, elements of that, which you know the UK may wish to diverge from, for example. So there's suddenly there's a lot more flexibility um, if the UK chooses it. Um, but clearly the downside of choosing it is that it then signifies to the EU27 that it is diverging. So it's unlikely to get equivalent. Um, so, but I think you know it, having that having that having that potential control is, is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, over time, it may be something that the UK will will gradually look to take advantage of. And I think the FCA have been very sensible up to now. I mean, their, their policy stance on the share trading obligation, I think, shows just how sort of how sort of aware they are of the need to to try to protect the UK business interests. While also, you know, respecting the rules, um, and and I'm sure they'll continue to to look at to look at it through that through that prism. It's quite rare that the regulator comes in for praise, actually. But to, to be fair to them, since the financial crisis, they've they have actually run a pretty steady ship over some reasonably challenging environments. And the fact they're not getting taken to pieces in the press too much probably mean it is a good sign that they're actually doing pretty good. Actually, doing a pretty good job. Um, Mark, from your perspective, can you? What would you see as the uh, things about the future outside the EU that may be of particular benefit to Wellington and their clients? Yeah, I think the um, uh, well, the points that that various people have made already on the on the call are, are all are all good ones. Um, I think the 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 main benefit. Uh, if there is one long term, has to be in the flexibility. Uh, the, ch the main challenge that is certainty. So I think at the moment it is hard to plan and hard to figure out ways to take advantage of some of the long run uh, opportunity set because it's just not clear where things are going. So um, you know, I, I think that the opportunities that that that, pe that that have been outlined already in the in the discussion, I I agree with all of those, but I but I. And I'm not sure I've much to add beyond that, um, except to observe that with any change, there's there's always an opportunity, particularly for an investment-led firm. Um, but it's very hard to plan long term for the benefit of clients without some degree of certainty. And I think that's a real threshold issue to getting beyond this current very reactive phase of the exercise to these um, uh, potential uh, legendary uplands that we're hearing, hearing so much about. Thank you, Mark. So we've been talking for the best part of three quarters of an hour now. So I'm going to um, pass it over. If anyone um, watching has a particular question they would like to put to the panel generally or a particular member of the panel, you can use the chat function uh, on your uh, Zoom thing at the bottom and I will uh, pick as many as I can to run through. Um, as I say, if we, we've run out of time to go through some of them. Um, we will look at trying to um, put them to the panel afterwards and, and see if we can respond to as many of them as, as possible. Um, the first one that's come is it's quite a specific fun asset management one. So I'll put it to Mark um, and John. Is Brexit changing your views on vehicles in Cayman versus Europe and within Europe Lux versus Ireland? Um, John, do you want to... Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, not not in the short term, it isn't. I think um, you know our our situation actually with a, as a manager now of Irish funds is that with effect from the end of the transition period, um, our Irish funds, from marketing purposes, will be no different to Cayman funds. We'll lose the Article Thirty Two marketing passport, which is one of the main benefits of us moving to Ireland ten years ago. However, that being said, when we moved to Ireland ten years ago. As a proportion of our total client base, we had a far larger number of EU clients than we do today. We've we've extended our, our non-EU business significantly, not not sort of deliberately, just that's how it's how it's worked out. Um, so you know, it will certainly be harder to market, but it will be no harder than it would be to market a Cayman fund. So in a sense, we're just we're back we're back to where everyone else is <laughs> as of first of January. 
Um, I think the one thing, though, that is of interest and potentially in the future would be the the current um, consultation that the Treasury is doing. We're looking at uh, UK fund structures uh, for professional investors, um, something that the UK has really been very slow on and um, you know, has, has allowed um, you know, the Caribbean jurisdictions, um, Ireland, Luxembourg in the EU, of course, all to really establish very, very significant fund industries. And the UK, you know, while we have our own set of funds for specific types of clients, on the on the professional investor side and on the alternative side, we really don't have anything at all. And um, and it's always been a bit of a puzzle to me why that is. But at the least now they're looking at it. And I think there's a good chance that in the next one or two years, the UK may have something that is um, is usable and uh, and you know could compete potentially with a, a Cayman or a a BVI fund structure, um, which isn't to say that people will necessarily rush to the UK, but at least when they're looking to set up new funds, they'll have the UK as an option they could consider alongside the Cayman Islands, the BVI. Uh, I mean, I think Ireland and Lux will always be very important for for, for sort of fund structures um, where you need access to EU clients. Um, and um, and obviously, there, there will be, and there are UK-based firms that have EU marketing hubs and uh, and can benefit from the, the the flexibility that goes with with an EU fund domicile. So I don't think that's necessarily going to change. But but I do think as all part of this Brexit debate, definitely um, the UK extending its um, its sort of um, its fund its fund structuring suite to to a proper professional investor vehicle would would be of, would be of interest and something that we would be we'd, I'd, I'd certainly be very interested to look at it. And uh, and it may it may be something in the future that we would consider using, and I'm sure other managers would consider using. Thanks, John. Mark, how about you? You guys had a particular check. Any any altering your views in Cayman versus Europe or Lux versus Ireland? I think not really triggered by Brexit. Uh, I, I, and I agree with with John's comments. I won't repeat them. Uh, I think it's already the case that the the different jurisdictions within Europe have different views on the desirability of Cayman as an investment um, location. Uh, that hasn't changed or rather that isn't changing as a consequence of Brexit. I suppose the other thing that that is somewhat perhaps pushed by Brexit, if not strictly directly triggered by, at least technically, but perhaps politically, is the consultation discussion around delegation under AFMD. And, and I suppose we're keeping an eye on that to the extent that that ends up with, uh, which I hope is unlikely, but an outcome where it becomes much harder to manage a uh, Luxor Irish fund from London, uh, then that will, I suppose, change the debate around how we think about uh, funds in those jurisdictions versus funds housed in Cayman. Thanks, Mark. I think the next one is probably uh, be good for the guys in, in private practice. With the general backdrop of increasing regulation, both discovery and implementation and oversight costs, do you see this as further evidence or support for the large players getting larger and the end of the smaller local global players? Well, I think when you when you, you look at the stats recently, I think it's something like the top five global players have 22 trillion USD under management. So there's, there's clearly huge consolidation that is that is being undertaken within the industry. And if you, you look at all the industry press and you, you talk to people and there, there is going to be future consolidation um, in one way, shape or form. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a place for the, the smaller managers which have their own you know you know their own sort of the ability to be nimble the ability to act the the fact that investors still need a degree of diversification and they they've, they've got large amounts to invest and want, want to do them across asset managers of different sizes with different strategies so it it is something to sort of watch this space to see how that will actually develop um in the long term um but it, as i say is it's more of a sort of a watch this space type of scenario really Charlotte, what was your view? No, I can only agree with the consolidation. And I think, again, obviously, with, um, you know, what we've seen as a result of, of Brexit as well, um, there's obviously uh, even more consolidation um, com combined with pandemic and other things. So I don't, I, I see that, but there's obviously also reports coming out from the UK about the importance of competition and looking at the sizes of organizations to, uh, you know, because of the challenge that, you know, the regulation, uh, you know, might, you know, hinder the way in which players can operate. So I think it's, 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 um, 
is reality right now, but I think that the regulators and the, you know, the com competition authorities are kind of looking at these issues. Oh, so we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to ask one question to each of the remaining panelists, which I think is, an, is a really interesting point. It's not so much Brexit specific, but if you had to look out over the next two years, what would you say would be the largest non-consensus regulatory change that might be adopted that isn't on people's radars today? Martin. I think it's it's something that's that's on on people's radars and and certainly the the the, the regulatory laws um, uh, have been looking at this quite a lot in, in the last couple of months. But it's maybe not the wider industry hasn't looked at it. And certainly Mark sort of alluded to it is the AFMD review. Um, a lot of people's Brexit structuring has been around the basis of we delegate back to London um, from Europe. Um, the European Union is looking heavily at restricting what could be delegated back to the UK. So that impacts what people can do in London vis-a-vis -vis being physically based in the EU and also putting uh, quantitative limits on that delegation. And obviously, if, if, your, if your Brexit strategy is around delegating back to people in London and you've not physically located, then clearly the implications of that are um, potentially quite severe, depending where, where we end up on that. Um, so I think that's probably the main thing which I'd sort of watch this space and, and see when the, I think the consultation is ending um, early in the new year, just to really see what, what the European regulators put out in that regard. Thanks, Martin. John, from your perspective? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, so um, not a lot to add to that, really. I think, but, but I, I think what is, um, what's really interesting, though, about the delegation point is, um, uh, you know, for uses, for, um, funds that run uses funds, um, you know, there's um, several trillion dollars of USIS money is delegated back to the UK from uh, from from EU uh, domiciles. Obviously, Luxembourg and Ireland being the, the principal uh, USIS jurisdictions for this purpose. And I think um, you know we uh, there's obviously a bigger debate about delegation, and there's been there's been sort of messages and messaging that I've heard, and I'm sure others have heard, which suggests that the European Commission are less minded. To, to push for significant changes to delegation, even though ESMA clearly have raised it in their letter back in August. Um, and, and of course, the, the other thing maybe that's helpful for the UK here is that, you know, okay, the UK is now a third country, um, but so is the United States, mm -hmm. and so is Hong Kong, and so is Singapore. And, um, you know, maybe um, maybe the new president of the United States um, will have a will have a slightly different approach, more internationalist approach um, in terms of engaging with with Europe, um, which will sort of help to ensure that the the EU and the Commission don't sort of push for things which um, which significantly reduce access um, to um, to European uh, product for, um, for, for non, for non EU based uh, asset management firms. And, and there is, there's a sort of protectionist question here as well. Is it right that the, 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 the Dutch pension fund shouldn't be able to have the best asset management firm in the world running its assets? Does it have to choose a firm that's in the EU 27? Now, obviously there are good firms in the EU 27, but there might be better firms outside the EU 27. And so, you know, there's clearly going to be a big debate on this, um, uh, and, and and where we end up on delegation, we'll, we'll know. You know, I guess um, sort of by next summer, we'll get the first inklings um, when the Commission maybe publish their their initial draft um, mm. draft regulations, um, draft directive, and, and the whole trilogue process kicks off, which will no doubt drag on for a while. Um, but I do think, yeah, I, I don't think it can be under. Um, you know, one, one can't sort of um, uh, one can't ignore this one. I think the AIFMD review is, is really, really quite significant. Charlotte. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with previous speakers, of course. Um, that's very much on our list to watch, uh, especially looking at it from the kind of lobbying in Europe, I guess without the UK being one of the main players and, and what that means for the industry, which is obviously a great concern. Um, I mean, I was kind of thinking a bit more further ahead and the continuation on the theme of divergence, uh, more from a point of view of, of increased fragmentation. 
uh, and the challenge to firms with the fact that the regulators across the globe may not be walking hand in hand, which comes more back to, um, I guess, the point that we are in a situation where we, we are not seeing the same amount of, of, of trade relationships, maybe. Uh, we may not have the same focus as we had as part of, of the efforts post financial crisis um, with uh, globalization in the sense of digitalization. Um, the challenges in managing data, um, you know, all of those things coming out. I, I do think we can envisage seeing regulation being implemented to protect, uh, you know, the data, the use of technology, et cetera, but maybe not in a way that is kind of harmonized and therefore post challenges, if you see what I mean, on firms just to kind of manage, manage their way forward. Um, I can I can speak forever about the things I fear about Europe, <laughs> because I think if we talk regulation, de delegation, we can talk about reverse inquiry as another way of closing down the way to do business. Um, but I just, just put something else out there. I think some of those things worry me about where we go in the direction of travel uh, in a more global world. Perfect. Thanks. And then finally, um, on to Mark. Uh, so. Delegation feels like the big known unknown. Um, I think in the interest of debate, I'll pick a flavour of divergence as well, uh, because it, I'm struck by the fact that a lot of the changes to European re uh, f uh, financial regulation were driven by the UK. So it will require quite a shift in mindset if we decide to uh, go off and embrace divergence uh, on the basis that we're not going to get equivalent so let's let's make the most of it then that requires quite a fundamental shift in the way that the fca has approached regulation in the uk uh, really since well at least at least mifid one days and, and and perhaps even going back to you know um uh, but before then so um that, that if, if that happens then that that will I feel like I keep making a similar point now I think about it, but that, that will introduce more uncertainty for us, I suppose, that suddenly we're dealing with a regulator with a very different outlook. Uh, and I think that could be positive. Um, that could be negative. It, it will be different, and that is very hard to plan for. Uh, and so that is, that is my answer for a thing that's not really on people's radar, because it is very hard to know how to put it on your radar, even if it's something which, uh, which occurs to you. Thanks, Mark. And that is our allotted time. Um, so all that's left for me to do is say thank you, everyone who's tuned in um, for our first live stream event. And a big thank you to everyone on our panel. Uh, Martin Coombs from Gibson Dunn, John May from Marshall Waste, Mark O'Brien from Wellington Management, Charlotte Starlin from Simmons & Simmons, the next episode on the General Counselling Podcast is a cracker. It's covering private equity with James Scott from Freshfields and Jeff Balash from Blackstone. So follow me on LinkedIn and you'll see when it's released, which I think is due on Monday. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, big thanks to the panel. That was a brilliant discussion. I'd like to think it's the end of the Brexit debate, but I have a feeling it may not be. Thanks very much. <laughs>